This is Windows on Mars, bringing you breaking news stories on scientists, astronauts, artists, and young people, together imagining and creating the future. Now, here to put you in the picture is the entire Mars Mission News Team. News anchor Donna Shirley, former manager of the Mars Exploration Program. Feature reporters Jeff Sanchez and Danell Morgan. And Mars weather, David Walters. Together with our exclusive team of coast-to-coast -coast on assignment reporters. This is Windows on Mars. Welcome to Windows on Mars. Today's top story, the possibility of a settlement on the planet Mars in the year 2030 has people talking. Not just talking, Jeff. Scientists, astronauts, artists in all fields, and young people of all ages are getting together to experiment and plan for this incredible mission. In this special report of Windows on Mars, we'll bring you the latest developments in four different areas. A glass artist on a storybook farm in Massachusetts and his astronaut wife in space. How do art and science relate? And how will the harsh Mars environment affect the kind of community we build there for humans to survive, work, and create on the red planet? Music from Space Sounds, a computer power book programmed with musical instruments. Is this how we take music to Mars? And will it sound different from music on Earth? Storytelling before the fire. How does it preserve our past as well as our future? What new stories and new art might be created from a Mars experience? Dance right out of a dream. No problem on Mars. What new challenges and possibilities when we move under reduced gravity? So stay with us for all the exciting details and latest developments in these and other news-breaking stories as we take a look through these four fascinating windows on Mars. If artists and scientists began talking to each other, what would they say? And where? Well, the sky is literally the limit in our first story. One's down home on the farm, and the other's totally far out in space. We go now to rural Massachusetts, where a very special artist and astronaut live when they're both at home here on Earth. But this farm and this relationship are different since it literally is a marriage between art and science. Because Josh is a successful glass artist, and Katie is a U.S. astronaut. I began to make planets really because of Jim Lovell, who was on his way back from the moon on an Apollo mission. And uh, Jim looked out the window of his spacecraft and said, hey, I can cover the Earth with my thumb. And when I thought about that picture, I began to make planets. In order to blow glass, you have to be a combustion engineer and you have to be an electrician and a plumber. So without science, without technology, I can't do what I do. The best of science is art and the best of art is science. Katie Coleman has been an astronaut with NASA for seven years. While on a recent mission aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia, our own Donna Shirley conducted this amazing interview with Katie in space and her husband Josh at home in Massachusetts. Katie, I'd like to ask you some questions about you're a scientist and your husband is an artist and how science and art work together and how you and your husband work together. I, I guess um, people always tease my husband and I because he makes planets. Anybody who has the imagination to design and create artwork like that understands why someone like me likes to go. You know, Katie, that you and I just do amazingly different things. Um, and yet, we both kind of enhance each other's uh, view of what we do. How would you personally feel about being part of a Mars settlement? I would be very, very excited about a future Mars settlement. I guess uh, exploration has been in my family for a long time and I've always wanted to know what else is out there. How would art and science work together? Can you imagine that? Well, I guess I can only speak from my own experience here on the shuttle. We're up here to do a very technical job and yet we need to make sure that we take time 
to look out the window and look back at the earth. It's actually more beautiful than any picture you have ever seen. That sounds really exciting. But can you suggest some of the skills that a hundred person village on Mars might need to take with them? Well, I think in the beginning people will think of technical skills. They'll think, well, we need a geologist, you know, we need a pilot, we need a commander, and that we need folks that understand how to build the places that we're going to build. But I think when we get this group of people together, we're going to find that they also bring along many of the artistic skills that we've been talking about. And where, where they take those artistic skills, what kinds of art and music and display and dance and writing, what kinds of things come out of that settlement, I don't think we know yet, and I can't wait to find out. Wow. It makes me wonder about all kinds of connections between science and art and how they might connect to build a community on Mars. If you and your family were going to build a home, what's the first thing you'd do? I would take a good look at the land we were going to build it on first. Now these pictures of the Mars surface were taken by a camera on the 1997 Pathfinder lander. Not too different looking from some desert lands on Earth. But there are things about this piece of land that the pictures don't show. For more on that, let's go to David Walters with the day's Mars weather report at this very site. David, what have you got for us? Thank you, Jeff. Well, the high temperature today here at Aries Valleys will be 7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is balmy for Mars, after some high water ice clouds in the early morning hours. But then get out your woolen jacket for a very chilly minus 109 degrees Fahrenheit tonight. Brr, I can already feel it. Wind should be light and variable coming from all directions and rotating around in their usual counterclockwise direction. And in the long range forecast, we have the possibility of a very thin but nasty dust storm coming in by the weekend. Now for some comments on today's Mars weather. I have a special guest, Dr. Diana Blaney, planetary scientist at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Apart from the big range in temperatures, if you and I were standing in this spot, right now on Mars. How would it be different? Well, one of the big things you'd notice is that the gravity is a lot less. The gravity is only about three-eighths of what it is on Earth. If you weighed 50 pounds on Earth, you'd only weigh about 15 pounds on Mars. Wow. Another thing is that the nighttime temperatures, especially in the polar regions, can get really, really cold, down to minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> That's pretty cold. The atmosphere is very thin and it's almost composed of all of carbon dioxide, which is different than the Earth, which has a lot of oxygen and nitrogen. So that would make it really difficult to breathe. It would be impossible to breathe. And finally, because there's such a thin atmosphere, there's nothing to stop the ultraviolet radiation from reaching the surface. It's like if the Earth had absolutely no ozone layer. All right. Well, thank you, Diana. It's not quite the same as Earth. That's it for Mars weather today. Back to you, Jeff, and more on what this means for human settlement on Mars. What materials are available on Mars for creating? Donna put this question to geologist Dr. Joy Crisp. I'm here today from the Mars yard at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where we test rovers and other things that we're going to send to the surface of Mars. So, Joy, we have a whole variety of things here. What could we do with this on Mars if we were building a village of a hundred people on Mars, what, what would we do with these things? Well, um, you'd be quite limited. Um, the first thing you could do is perhaps just take boulders of, of the basalt. You might be able to make walls and things like that and start some structures. The obvious thing that you might want is cement. Yes. And uh, you need to find some calcium carbonate type mineral. So you might need to uh, do some mining, scouting for these minerals on Mars and the ones that you don't find you'd have to bring with you. Now that we know something of the materials available on Mars, how would we go about designing a community living space? We go now to the Los Angeles Office of Architects, Craig Hodgetts and Ming Fung. Danelle, this is a company that designs a whole range of unique environments from buildings and traditional architectural settings to multimedia and virtual environment installations. Now, I ask the owners about designing on Mars after putting the same questions to planetary scientist Albert Yen at JPL earlier today. If you go back to the Stone Age on Earth, uh, people just put a whole bunch of rocks together and build a, something that'll keep them inside from the outside. Similar sorts of things can happen on Mars. There are uh, volcanic 
uh, lava flows. You can go and extract some rocks from that and, and try to build a, a little house of some sort. People all throughout history has always worked with the natural landscape to create their own habitat where they can live. You know, whether you go up to the, you know, the Mesa and the, the Indian Pueblo and then they would you know, carve their own um, uh, dwelling inside of the rock of the mountain. Well, a planet like Mars, by contrast to the United States, doesn't have a whole lot of different building materials. The very tough thing is that there's no wood, you know. There's, the things that we take for granted here don't exist. Even a variety of stones like we have here probably don't exist because the whole planet is made of, the skin, so far as we know, is made of basalt. So you could, you could literally carve into the ground a, some kind of dwelling as a space. And in order to keep it hermetically sealed, then you could inflate it, a skin within it, and then the skin would then attach itself to the cavity of that space, and then you would have a hermetically right. sealed environment. The Martian surface is very different from the Earth's environment. The atmosphere is much thinner, and that allows uh, UV radiation to get down to the surface. These environmental situations, which are unique to Mars, can potentially alter the surface. Our solution might be to build some very, very, very large uh, environments which keep the air in. The air would come in and it would blow this up and pretty soon you'd have a dome that you could live in. And maybe you could grow plants and trees inside and then you could build smaller structures in which people could live and kind of have their own individual lives. We know that there is a large abundance of silicon in the Martian soils that has been determined by the Viking landers as well as a Pathfinder lander that went down and actually analyzed the soil. The difficulty would then be extracting that silicon and making um, it pure enough that you can make uh, a glass. I think, we, I think that if we could make glass on Mars, um, it would open up so many opportunity to, uh, to build really quite incredible uh, structures there. Like a stained glass cathedral window, you could introduce in, integrally to the glass all these wonderful colors. And furthermore, when you've got just the big old red desert out here in front, big red desert out here, then you can put those colors together. That could be a lot of fun. If we go over there, it's like camping out a little bit. You know, when you go on a camping trip, you have to think about what are the necessities that would make you feel comfortable. The essential things that we can bring with us to sustain ourselves there, but at the same time feel like we are at home. What is it that we can take so that we can just barely survive there? Next up, a look at the question. How would you begin to design a community for 100 people on Mars? especially given the limitations we've just heard about. For some answers, let's go now to correspondent Karen Redhawk for this special report. Before the European settlement of the Americas, Native Americans lived in harmony with their natural surroundings, which they used for sources of housing, clothing, food, and art. Michael Horace, of Apache and Yaqui Indian descent, is a distinguished Native artist who relies on traditional materials to create jewelry, paintings, and ledger art. This is an old style bracelet. It's all made from turquoise. This is what turquoise actually looks like when it comes out of the ground. As an Indian person, you learn that everything in your environment is connected to everything else. We learn from little children that every small bug, that every plant, that every rock, that, that the streams, that the trees, that all these things are all dependent upon each other in order to survive. It's a mutual respect. And I think that's the most important thing that we can take to other planets. Michael met with Don Jackson, another Native American artist, and JPL scientist Matt Gullenbeck to explore materials on Mars for creating. Matt, I'm, I'm really curious about what kind of, of uh, minerals and gems you would find on Mars. The kind of materials we know that exist on Mars are the basic kind of rocks we have on the Earth. In fact, the most common rock on the Earth is called basalt. 
And there's one thing on Mars that we know there's a lot of, and that's red pigment. <laughs> I mean, Mars is a red planet, and there's an awful lot of dust that gives pretty much everything you see a red hue. Adobe, where I'm from, is one of the best insulators to build uh, a structure. There's a high probability we have clays, mm. and it'd be easy to take that surface dust and, and perhaps mix it with things and, and make a, a structure out of it, I would think. Anything that we find, we use in our, in our art. So, yeah, sure. well, Art ties you into your environment. It makes you become part of it. And that's what we as Native artists try and do when we do our art. Much can be learned from Native American traditions relating to future life on Mars. But there are still many questions that remain unanswered about Mars' environment that can be answered by both scientists and artists. This is Karen Redhawk for Windows on Mars. A lot to think about as we design the first community on Mars. What do you think, Jeff? Would you rather live in a dome or an underground community? Mm, definitely underground, I think. I think it would be cool. Well, not literally cool, because one of the reasons we'd be there would be to escape the minus 100 degree temperatures on the surface. <laughs> well, how would you use the space to make a community? What do you mean? Well, you've got 100 people. Would everyone be living in one big space together? Or would each family have its own area? And would you even take families? I'll need some time to think about all that. Our next story, NASA officials estimate that it cost around $10,000 to put one pound of materials into Earth orbit. For the 2030 Mars settlement mission, the lowest estimates run at $50,000 per pound of materials taken to Mars. Obviously, what is carried on such a mission needs to be carefully considered. Ellen Kochansky and Jamie Davis have discovered creative ways to reuse what was thought unusable and combine it with natural materials. What would they create on Mars? I live in the country, my family and I, and I have a chance to make trails through my woods leading down to a waterfall. And in the process of making that trail, I would have cuttings of Mount Laurel, I would have stones, and it, it occurred to me some, sort of instinctively at some point, well, I should bring some of this home. It was in my studio, and I started putting it in the context of all this sort of high-tech, commercial, industrial materials that suggest that world. Quilters are pack rats. Quilters have a way of recycling things as a force in their work, and what we do is make our expression using something that might have been thrown away. It was grandmother's nightshirt. It was a, it was a piece of the living room curtain. Those kind of, uh, of stories give all quilt work depth. If I saw rocks on the surface of Mars, I think uh, in the context of my work, something that might appear quite ordinary would become transformed. You would look at it, the details, the shape, the color, uh, in a whole new way. And of course, going to Mars, we'll all have to realize there are no landfills. And everything that goes must be recyclable, reusable, again and again. The contents of that spaceship if people choose things that are made by hand, they've chosen very specially those few things that are meaningful enough that they need, that they'll use what we take with us to Mars. The beautiful must be necessary, and the necessary must be beautiful. As you can see, we know quite a lot about Mars that we didn't know even a few years ago. Imagination is where it really begins in creating artworks, designing buildings, and planning a community on Mars. All space missions combine imagination with skill and sheer hard work by teams of dedicated people, often in the face of doubters. Many people thought the Pathfinder team was crazy to use airbags, landing on Mars like a beach ball. Others thought the idea of a rover the size of a microwave oven was equally silly. Imagination was where those ideas came from, and imagination made them work. Artists also use imagination to make ideas work. 
artists like contemporary painter Chuck Arnoldi. Paint comes in all kinds of colors. And even though you can buy all these colors, I'm never quite satisfied. What happens is you get an idea, so you pursue it, and the problem is that ideas are beautiful and perfect. It's like falling in love. When you start to make the thing real, it takes on a life of its own, and the imperfections start to show up, and it becomes a battle. This is real problematic for this painting. <laughs> it's looking pretty good. I like it a lot, but there's certain things I really don't like about it, and I can't figure out, I've got to do some small thing to this to pull it off. All it is is this pursuit of this imagination. When I start one of these paintings, I usually have an excitement, an energy level. I usually put a canvas up and I look at it, and then when I get this, the right courage, I go up and I just start to work. Anything you've heard about or seen, it was done by somebody. So if you have the inclination to want to be a rocket scientist, or a rock and roll star, or an artist, it's, it's something, somebody, somebody does it. You can do anything you want to do. Every idea I have leads to an action, and every action that you do leads to infinite possibilities. Next up, music and sound on the Red Planet. How does sound travel on Mars? What Earth music do we take, and what new music might we develop there? How far out are you willing to go? These stories coming up on Windows on Mars. Welcome back. In this segment of Windows on Mars, we'll consider and listen to some possibilities for new music on Mars. How does music come from people's experience? On Earth or in space? How would you take music from Earth to Mars and listen to it there? What do you think about music in and for outer space? First, we take you to New York, where our reporter Jamie Chen is standing by. Jamie? Danell, I'm here in the South Bronx where Los Planeros de la 21, a New York-based Puerto Rican music group, is about to perform. These gardens are part of a community meeting place called the Casitas, where they first began playing together. Since then, they've performed all around the world, including many jazz festivals, Carnegie Hall, and a folklore festival in Russia. They believe that music comes from our need to express who we are and where we've come from. One of the forms of music uh, originated in Puerto Rico, mostly from African descent. Started late 19th century, early 20th century, but this captures, La Plena captures the personality of the Puerto Rican people. music plays is that, that it tells a lot of stories and that culturally it tells about our way of life. It talks about our traditions, our, our heirs, it talks about gossip, it talks about uh, all kind of current events. Whenever something happens in a, in a place close by here, just like in Puerto Rico from town to town, same thing here in the Bronx, Manhattan or Queens, uh, you know, pioneers of this music, the Bomba and Plena, we make songs about them. This is the newspaper of our land, for La Plena. And he, he's just, you know, seven years old, he just, he just got it. We can see that he, no question about it, he will follow the tradition. We pass it on because we want our traditions to stay, our traditions to be around forever our native language to be around and that's what that's what you need some of your own culture and that's what's going to give you your identity when you know about yourself you have fulfilled your dream i think you 
can go to another planet, but you take your traditions with you, and your traditions are, will always stay. And your children will learn and know about that. Yeah. 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 Nice. With music like this on Mars, no one would forget who they are or where they came from. This is Jamie Chen reporting from the South Bronx, New York for Windows on Mars. Back to you, Donnell. Thanks, Jamie. More on the music we'd take to Mars in a moment. But first, let's check in again with David for a Mars weather update on those dust storms developing there. David? Janelle, this appears to be a very large storm, bigger than anything we're used to on Earth. Uh, in fact, scientists have reported dust storms that reached around the entire planet. The blowing red dust is what gives the planet its red color, as you can see. And since you've been talking about sound on Mars, I have a question about that for my guest today, Dr. Greg Wilson of JPL. And my question is, uh, the winds on Mars, would they sound the same as the winds on Earth? And, and how does sound travel on Mars? I think a, a good dust storm on Mars is, is, is going to be a really violent event, and you're going to certainly hear it. But I think what we associate with wind blowing on Earth is it the wind blowing through your hair and your ears and that high-pitched whistle. Mm -hmm. uh, high-pitched sounds don't travel very very well on Mars, and so you certainly wouldn't hear that, especially since you're going to be in a spacesuit and in your habitat. Uh, because of the really thin Martian atmosphere, sound doesn't travel nearly as well. Mm -hmm. Only really low-frequency sounds uh, can travel any great distance on Mars, and you really have to yell and shout wow. uh, to, get that, to get that heard. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. You're very welcome. Back to you, Jeff. Let's hear now from a man who has some very definite and practical ideas on how to take music to Mars. Composer Morton Sabotnik discussing some possibilities with JPL engineer Rob Manning. So what kind of music do you think we should bring to Mars? Does Mars have a special kind of musical content that you think that would uh, be, be prevalent in the future? What we'd want to take with us has to do with the past and the present, and, we, and from that we create the future. But given the fact that we'd probably be bringing it on a little laptop computer, mm -hmm. we have actually, we could bring thousands and thousands of pieces of music with us. The computer becomes like an orchestra, and you can control it. So it, do, it isn't just recordings you're bringing, but it's a viable, dynamic, changing thing that you have impact. You actually make it louder and softer. If I touch this key, you get a repeated note. If you touch this key, you get that. In this key, you get that. In this key, you get that. Where, 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 does, where does the science come back into your art? I mean, do, do you visualize the, the, the music, and do you work with the music in a scientific and a mathematical way? Music is, in fact, a kind of higher math. It has connections, it has relationships. And I think maybe the creative process is similar maybe in science and art. You have a, a general approach to what you think might be there. It's testing it and then seeing if it works and then going back and changing the model itself Absolutely. or changing the way in which you do it, which I think is a scientific method, it's, right? It is the scientific method. It's exactly what we do when we build our spacecraft. So it looks like the most valuable instruments for music on Mars could be the computer and the human voice. Or anything else we come up with in the 21st century. Remember, synthesized music wasn't even thought about 100 years ago. What do you think we'll hear? That's a good question. And while I'm thinking about it, let's go to the Jet Propulsion Lab in Southern California, where scientist Dr. Greg Wilson is with a music producer who has combined space data from NASA with the music of Bach. Kelvin, tell me about how you took the data that we collected from the atmospheric instrument on Mars Pathfinder. How did you turn it into sound? Well, uh, actually what we did was to take the 22,000 bits of data that you sent us and uh, creatively entered it into a computer that uh, gave us some highs and lows. We used our imagination as to what it might sound like or what the pattern might be in different places mm -hmm. on Mars. And then we assigned sound that Earthlings detect as wind to try and create what we thought would be the winds of Mars. It's definitely more art than science, but it's art that's certainly inspired by science. Do you think the environment is really what drives the artist and what type of art they create? I think that music, just like writing or 
sculpting or anything like that is is coming from your own personal experience mm -hmm. and your environment is a huge part of that personal experience. And Bach came into my mind because the music of Bach is, in some ways, it's very mechanical. It's very mathematical, if you will. It, I think it comes from the same kind of minds that, that dream up uh, spacecraft. So, if you guys were going to Mars, what instruments would you take from Earth, or would you make your own? I'd take a harp. Well, I definitely think it's a lot easier to transport the human voice than it is, say, a <laughs> musical instrument. Um, but I think there's going to be a whole new realm of experiences that these people on Mars will encounter. There are many kinds of music and many ways of taking it to Mars. We visited with two youth orchestras this week and put this question to some young people. What kind of music would you take to Mars? I would probably take Mozart because he's my favorite composer. Blues to... Uh rock to classic rock. I'd probably take a jazz CD to Mars. I'd probably take punk. I think I would take some folk rock. If I went to Mars, I would take reggae. It would have to be something with a lot of soul. I played in the orchestra and I really liked it. I like the slowness of it and then how it can pick up big timpani drums in the background. It's got a lot of heart to it. I've grown up around it playing violin since I was four and a half and takes me into like my really creative sources. Music is important to me because it helps me deal with everyday life. It lets you have the chance to express all your feelings. It gives me a reason to get up in the morning. If you have no one to talk to or if you're bored, I just, I just love it. <laughs> If I was going to Mars, I would probably take the drums. Bass. Piano. Guitar. My violin. My voice. I would take bongos. I would definitely want to make new music on Mars because it's, it's a totally different place and like just your surroundings can totally influence you and in the music you play. When we come back, a look at how folklore storytelling, and traditional arts might develop in a Mars settlement. What do we take from Earth? What do we leave behind? And what new arts might develop on Mars? For the answers to these and other questions, stay with us for more Windows on Mars. Where do stories come from in different cultures? What stories might come out of a Mars community in 2030? How would you choose the 100 participants for the planned settlement? And what Earth traditions and folk arts should they take with them? And what new traditions might they begin? What role do traditional arts play in a community here on Earth? And what role could they play on Mars? Our lead story in this segment takes us to a suburban home where young people are listening to stories from three very different traditions, African American, Native American, and Mars. Dan Blesser files this special report. Folklore is the sayings and stories of a people that are passed on from generation to generation. They often tell the history and traditions of a race told in an entertaining way. Let's take a look at some stories from our three very special guests. Who do you think he met come hippity hopping down the road? We have to be very good observers. Yankee doo doo, aqui no hay which means this is what my grandfather told me. We need to maintain the oral tradition, and that is of sharing. Everyone laughed when we said we wanted to send a rover this size to Mars. Stories are very powerful in uh, telling us where we might go and giving us the visions of the future. Well, you know, back long, long time ago, back during the days when the animals talked, rabbits had little bitty short ears and long bushy tails. 
The griot, the storyteller in the African tradition, would gather all the history, and then in order to give the history in a way that would be remembered, they would put it into a story, or they would use instruments, or they would use even a dance. So all of the arts were engaged in, in telling the story and keeping the history so that people would remember. There was a beautiful pond, and in this pond over in what is now North Carolina lived Sale Gugi Usti. Sale Gugi Usti, little turtle. Storytelling in the Native American culture was a way of giving instructions. It was how the people were taught. Through the stories, you teach how to behave. All of the, all of the Cherokee stories that I've run across, there is a moral to it. And this is the rover, just like the rover that's on Mars. And she's named for a woman named Sojourner Truth, who was an Afro-American woman, a freed slave, who went around the South telling the truth about the evils of slavery. So Sojourner Truth, the rover, travels around Mars telling us the truth about Mars. Mm. Well, Mars already has a lot of folklore. Going back thousands of years, the Egyptians thought it was the star of death. The uh, Romans and the Greeks thought it was the god of war because it was red. And uh, so they named it Mars and Ares after their god of war. So, you like fish, do you? Well, i tell you how you can get all the fish you want. You just go on down to the creek on any old cold, cold night. And you take you some bait and you uh, put that bait on your tail. And then you put your tail in the water. I think it's really important for us to be able to share our stories because actually we are all here on the earth and we all share in it and so we're all part of it together and so what we want to do is to be able to share our stories together and know that we're one. Sale Gugi Usti, little turtle, wanted to fly more than anything else in the world and Molosh would tell him, you silly turtle, you don't have any feathers, you don't have any wings, how can you fly? Come on, now stop being silly, let's go play. And they go In play. going to Mars and establishing a culture on Mars, one of the first and foremost things to realize is to listen to those who have gone before and learn from them. Now, after three months when the lander's batteries died, Sojourner couldn't talk to us anymore. And so what she was programmed to do was, after a week, if she didn't hear from us, and she couldn't hear from us because we couldn't hear from her, she would start to go around the lander saying, hello. And then she'd go a little farther and say, hello. The understanding of the place of storytelling and the place of the stories that define how you are as a community are going to be very, very important when we get an actual colony on Mars or a village on Mars. Because if 100 people are going to live together, they have to tell stories to define who they are. So she flew around and grabbed hold of Brother Rabbit's tail and she pulled and she pulled and off came Brother Rabbit's tail and she flew on out of there. But don't you know, ever since then, from that day to this, rabbits have had long floppy ears and short bushy tails. And that's how the rabbit lost his tail. And to this very day, you go to a stream, a lake, or a pond. And on a bright, sunshiny day, lined up on the rocks and the logs will be turtles. They'll have their little necks stretched out and their eyes will be shut. They'll be dreaming about flying which is a lot safer if you're a turtle. <laughs> Nigga. So Sojourner's up on Mars right now, frozen. She's a rover sickle. But one of these days, you're going to go to Mars, one of you, and pick up Sojourner and bring her home so I can have her here in my living room. And that's the story. <laughs> so there you have it. Stories from our past, present, and future, all telling us about who we are. This is Dan Blesser reporting for Windows on Mars. What people and arts would you include on an international Mars team? And what represents Earth culture that they might take with them? One person who has thought and imagined how life might exist on Mars is well-known science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson. What is the difference between science fact and science fiction to you? Well, they have a relationship. 
uh, that is circular. The science facts are what stimulate science fiction writers to do their work. The science fiction writer, the very first one, said, well, we could easily cobble together a human being from parts in the graveyard and put the right electrical charge to it, and this person would walk around again. And that was Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and the first science fiction writer, 19 years old at the time that she wrote that mm -hmm. book. Talk a little bit about how you came up with the ideas that were the imagination part of your stories, uh, the things that were the people and how they acted and how they conducted themselves. And sure, so on. sure. Well, it starts from the uh, what I want for the stories, uh, beginning by okay, I, very simple. I want to walk around on Mars. I want people there, and then you, from following from that, they had to have a habitat they could live in. You had to imagine what kind of people would go. They would be people who would have multiple competencies. So if if you were going to be advising the chroniclers of the colony on Mars, people who would be writing science fiction or writing on Mars, what would you suggest for them? Well, the first thing I'd suggest is knowing as much about science as they possibly can. I think uh, uh, the artists of the 21st century are going to be um, heavily involved with the sciences. The two kind of uh, melt together at the edges. So there's a big utopian um, aspect to all of our thinking about Mars right now. When we think about Mars, we're thinking about how can we make things better mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, a mirror to Earth, or it's a lens through which we look at our, our hopes for, for what can happen here as well. Moving from science fiction to factual experiments and what we might take to Mars of Earth's performing arts and culture. We go now to our reporter at a school in New York City, where ethnic music specialist Dr. Craig Woodson, JPL scientist Dr. Claudia Alexander, and an international group of children are exploring some possibilities. Dr. Craig Woodson has been making musical instruments since he was 14. Finding out about homemade musical instruments in other countries, he decided to expand his work to concerts and children's programs like this one. What kind of musical instruments would he make on Mars? Imagine we're going to Mars, and can we take everything with us from Earth? No. If we were to go to Mars, what sorts of things might we take with us from the Earth? Well, uh, it, probably we would take the, I'd like to be able to take the music of the world. So can you imagine an instrument that might have a tube and a cup and some string? You might have to take string. Each one of these represent an instrument from different countries. The Australian didgeridoo would be uh, similar to the horn. What does that sound like? An elephant. So you can put animal sounds. Didgeridoo from Australia. Uh, the two-string instrument from uh, Africa uh, called the gimbri. And then the drum is uh, very similar to an instrument from the Philippines. Claudia, how would you actually make music on Mars? If you think about it, the most difficult thing about making music in that environment is that you can't hear anything. Um, it takes a sound carries through a relatively thick atmosphere. So if there were no atmosphere, my voice, you know, my, my vocal cords would be moving just the same as usual, but there's no medium to carry the sound to your ears. Now, are you ready to make an instrument? Yes. How about making this one? a lot of wind on Mars. In spite of the fact that the atmosphere is thin, it does move with wind. And so if you had um, stones and rocks arranged in a certain order, as the wind passes through, and if the rocks are made of the right material and can vibrate a little bit, then you could have sound by arranging the rocks in a certain order uh, and, ha and have a sound that way. When you set this up, 
people are wanting, wanting to bring their culture with them. There's a saying in Africa uh, called Sankofa, which means you cannot move forward without remembering the past. So stories and stories associated with those artifacts, and it's not just musical instruments, it could be cloth, it could be food, all kinds of things associated with any given culture would want to be represented in this mission. <laughs> When we come back, a window on dance and movement. What effect will reduced gravity have on the way we move and dance on a planet like Mars? All coming up on Windows on Mars. Welcome back. In this final segment of Windows on Mars, we'll consider the possibilities for dance and movement on Mars. These dancers are defying gravity on Earth. But what happens on Mars where you only weigh a third of what you weigh on Earth? First, let's go to a report on the gravity on Mars. And who better to provide that than our very own meteorology man for Mars, Mr. David Walters. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that buildup. I really needed that. Now, we know that when astronauts go into space and when we've landed on the moon, where gravity is one-sixth of the Earth's gravity, it affects human movement like this. Now, there's a new dance. When we get to Mars, where the gravity is three-eighths of that on Earth, it'll be like the moon, only less so. Now, as you heard earlier, my 155 pounds will be only about 60 pounds on Mars. I have as my guest today uh, JPL scientist Dr. Matt Gollenbeck, who can tell us a little bit more about what this means. You're on, Matt. Well, gravity is important in everything we do. It's the weight on you when you walk. It affects everything you throw, <laughs> hold, hit, bat, kick, whatever it is. And if there's less gravity, then whatever you do, kick or throw or bat, will go much, much further. But if I jumped, so if I jumped, I'd be able to... Well, you'd have to overcome whatever the mass of the spacesuit was, and they're not light. And on the moon, in fact, they couldn't walk at all. They had to kind of lean forward, and they kind of bunny hopped around. That's the dance you were talking about? That's, yeah. that's the bunny hop. And that's because they okay. couldn't do anything else. Well, if we pretend <laughs> that we didn't have the spacesuit on, and we were on Mars, and we were bounding... Now you're talking. Now we need an astrodome. Okay. Okay? That would be pretty cool. I think it'd be very cool. <laughs> Why did you want that? Thank you very much, Doctor. You're welcome. Back to you, Jeff. Our first story in this segment provides a look at a fascinating East Coast-based dance group created by Elizabeth Streb. Right here on Earth, they are experimenting with movements that challenges Earth's gravity. Streb is a show, and it's based on the issue of wild action enacted by human beings, the body, and it deals with time and space also. So the kind of intersection of those three elements. Simple ideas, it's based on the premise that I believe humans can fly. I'm more interested in how do I create conditions of turbulence and then hurl us into them and watch us survive. So it becomes an event and not a presentation. The origin of my inspirations are now coming from certainly the circus and certainly the rodeo and certainly boxing and certainly bodies in many disciplines that are willing to go off the edge of their comfort zone into what I see as new territory. To find out more about the scientific and creative possibilities of moving in reduced gravity, Streb talked with Cornell University scientist Elena McCartney. Um, Elena, I'm really fascinated by the gravity on Mars and the nature of it as compared to the gravity on Earth. It's one of my obsessive attachments and investigative tools. Yeah, I had a great opportunity um, as a researcher to fly um, 11 times on the KC-135, which is NASA's is it the microgravity aircraft, the Vomit Comet, as it is known. Um, <laughs> and if you go over the top, you're in zero gravity for approximately a half a minute. There is no longer any up or down. 
So you want to be very careful to tether yourself or have a handhold you can grab. Now, Martian gravity is about one-third gravity. And when we go into Martian gravity on the KC-135, you float up into the air, but maybe one heel will still be touching the ground. You still maintain that little touch to the ground. But if you jump up and down, you know how when you're on a trampoline, how light you feel? And yes. then if you get back down on the ground and jump, you feel like you weigh 900 pounds. Right, right. You'd have that lightness. You'd come back down, but with a light touch. A lighter touch. And that would give you some control over your next motion, a frame of reference, as you said. If we got there to Mars and decided that everything we knew about communicating here had to go, and not, not think about language in the way we had and start from scratch. Yeah, we might not even have to decide. It might say, right. hey, you over there, you can't hear me, so I'm going to make a motion that gets your attention. And in less gravity, you're more able to make those moves. You could just imagine if language had meaning in that sense. Or, I, I could mean, do a flip and get your attention. <laughs> yes, that would get my attention. <laughs> I think that it would be presumptuous of me to imagine I would know what I would do once I got to Mars. But I think the first thing I would do, which is kind of slang for, to me, learning, is hang out. Mm -hmm. I'd hang out on Mars and see how it feels. Elena, do you want to go to Mars? I would love to go to Mars. When you really get down to why a scientist would be interested in exploring space, you, you come down to that love of life that is shared by the scientist and the artist. That there's that, that excitement of being alive and experiencing something. And we have different tools to do it with, and a different use of our senses, a different extension of our senses into space. But I think on some level we can share that excitement and, and that's where the arts come in. Next, how does dance and ritual preserve and show us our history and experience? Karen Redhawk has filed this report with one dance group doing just that. Karen? Danelle, as you may know, 600 years ago the Aztec people had an advanced community in Central America, complete with ceremonial pyramids, ball courts, their own calendar, and knowledge of the sun and planets. In Los Angeles and several other communities of the Southwest, many Mexican Americans are breathing new life into the dance and ritual traditions of their Aztec ancestors. These dances come from uh, Mexico City, and what we do is we maintain our tradition through different ceremonies that we have and these dances are taught within the ceremonies. And after ceremonies, you hear a lot of the older people, a lot of the older dancers talk about dance, tradition, history, music, culture. And through our old stories, we tell of our children of who we are and where we're going to. We lot which is the dove, is a dance that we teach our children. And there's parts in the, in the dance, what we do is we drop our hands forward to teach the symbolism of dropping seeds. And those seeds are then stomped by our feet to make fertile ground. If I were to take something with me, to start or to contribute to another planet, one of the biggest things is hope. And the idea that man could survive anywhere if he has that fire with him. And the fire can be anything that will let your, your imagination and your thoughts just open and be born. You know, the good thing about taking dance to Mars is it doesn't require any equipment. The human body is the creative instrument. And you can not only recreate events of the past, but you can create your own sense of the events that are taking place right there on Mars. Which takes us to our final story. A group that is dancing out its community story, as well as experimenting with new themes like space travel. We're watching a rehearsal of the Lula Washington Dance Theater, a modern dance company that tours the U.S. with uplifting programs for youth and adults. 
think, think. Ah, right. Yes, good. I started the dance as a uh, outlet for African American choreographers uh, to have a outlet to show their work and to give back to my community. Chris, turn your legs out. We have a youth dance company which goes out into the community and performs. They're being trained to use the arts as a way of continuing who they are, as a way of saving self. There's a whole bunch of us. JPL engineer Linda Robeck joined Lula and her dancers to explain her role in the 1997 Mars Pathfinder mission. On Mars Pathfinder, I was in charge of a team that bolted everything together on the spacecraft. You guys saw the video, right, of the way that thing all came in? My team, it was a team about this size, we actually took all those individual pieces and bolted them together and taped them together and tied them together to make sure that they were all ready to go. After watching NASA video of the 1997 Mars Pathfinder mission, Lula and her company created their version of a landing on Mars. Some of the stuff really jumped right out at me, the red background for the red surface of Mars. And then right at the beginning, the, the group is all together in, in a circle and they open up mm -hmm. like the petals of the lander opening up. The dancers that were in the center were sort of like the surveyors, like going away and coming back and checking the scene out and coming back and then telling everybody else what to do and how to do it. Yeah, because so. this gesture is very much like the antenna. It had to stick up and then it had to send the information to Earth. of science is very much trying to understand the, all the miracle of just existence and of living things and how things work but the arts are celebrating it mm -hmm. and both of them both the science and the arts really need to feel the passion of mm -hmm. the mysteries mm -hmm. of the universe in order to be able to either investigate them or exactly. express, express them, them. Yeah. 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 Possibilities are mind-boggling, and the only limitations are the imaginations of artists, scientists, and you and I. And that's where we'll leave you in this special look through four fascinating windows on Mars. We hope you've enjoyed the journey as much as we've enjoyed taking you there. And who knows, maybe we'll really see you on or live from Mars in the year 2030. Until then, this is Danelle Morgan. And Jeff Sanchez. With David Walters, Mars Weather, signing off. And I'm Donna Shirley, formerly of JPL's Mars Exploration Program. As we learn more about Mars from current and future missions, the answers to some of the questions we've considered here will become clearer. And now it's up to all of us, artists and scientists of all ages, but especially you, the scientists, artists, engineers, and explorers of tomorrow who could one day actually make that fantastic journey. And so that's it. Thank you very much for watching. This program was made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and its Jet Propulsion Laboratory for the Mars Millennium Project. I would love to go to Mars, but I will be too old. That'd be a great thing to do, you know, be able to go up there and check out outer space. I don't think they'd let me take my dog, I'm afraid. Um, but he's an awfully nice dog. <laughs> <laughs> how would we change the soil or enhance the soil with what we know about how plants grow on Earth to try to make plant life bloom on Mars? If we went to another planet, we would still create songs about the planet that we went to. When you stand and you look up in the sky, it's, it's hard to believe that, that this is the only place there is, and I'm sure there's other places out there, and I'd like to go and explore them. Well, I'd want to wear the right clothes if I was picked to go to Mars. I really believe everyone should wear black there. This would be a, a neat thing to do, to actually go there and, and look around. I would take the thoughts of my friends, because those are my 
Those are my touchstone. If we were allowed to take maybe one or two animals or birds or, or like I said, seeds, that would be the beginning for us. If people were to go to Mars and step there, and what, what, what a galvanizing moment. <laughs> yeah, that would bring the world together. The solar system really excites me, and anything that shows me um, the processes in the universe excites me, and uh, things on Earth do as well. It would be pretty interesting. I'm into traveling, so, <laughs> I mean, if it's possible. <laughs> if the ship were leaving today, I'd be on it.